Section 19, Floating Plant and Marine Activities. The goal of this section is to familiarize students with marine construction equipment and operations. The references for this section include U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Engineering Manual 385-1-1 Safety Manual, EM 385-1-97 Explosives Manual, ER 385-1-91 Motorboat Operators Testing, EM 385-1-1 Inflatable PFD Standards for Use, 1 July 2007, Memorandum CECW-CO of 24 September 2009, Subject, Modification to List of Protective Clothing Allowed, 33 U.S.C. 569. Also, U.S. Coast Guard, 33 CFR, Parts 1 through 199, 46 CFR, Parts 1 through 199, OSHA, 29 CFR, 1915, 29 CFR, 1926, 29 CFR, 1918, and 29 CFR, 1919. The objectives of Section 1, Part A of this section are to identify definitions, background, and types of floating plants. Also, to identify authorities governing floating plants. What is a floating plant? A floating plant is defined as anything that floats and originally costs more than $500, exclusive of trailers and outboard motors, except for lifeboats, life rafts, and life flats, as governed by EP 1125-2-1, Appendix X from 1976. Why a floating plant? U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for maintenance of U.S. national waterways. In 1824 was the first rivers and harbors legislation directing the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to clear navigation. Has become a broad mandate including surveying, debris, snags, dredging, and revetment. It requires a variety of floating plant equipment and additional responsibilities appeared with time, including environmental, recreational, etc. The U.S. Army Corps floating plant background includes approximately 2,500 pieces of floating plant inventory, and it is unique from other federal fleets, including that of the U.S. Navy, the United States Coast Guard, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and Military Sealift Command and it is essentially commercial in design. The following are some U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plant terms. Tonnage, where gross tons equals 100 cubic feet. Net tons, which is equal to gross tons minus exempted spaces. Displacement tons, which is the weight of the vessel in long tons, or 2,240 pounds. The length overall, or LOA, is the maximum length of the vessel, including equipment, and knots, nautical miles per hour, where one nautical mile is equal to 6,076.1 feet. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Floating Plant Design The Marine Design Center, CEMDC, is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Center of Expertise for Vessel Design and Safety. It is nationally recognized for naval architecture and engineering, and it is willing to supply level of service the customer requires. The following images show an overview of U.S. Army Corps of Engineers dredges. Some of these include hopper, cutter head, dust pan, split hull, special purpose, and sidecaster. Mechanical dredges. This section describes the different types of mechanical dredges, their advantages and disadvantages, and how their production is estimated. Comments 
concerning the environmental issues associated with using mechanical dredges are also addressed. In general, mechanical dredges use some form of bucket to excavate and lift the dredged material from the bottom, then load it onto a barge and transport it to the in-water disposal site. Mechanical dredges are held in position with either spuds or wire rope and anchors during digging operations. They are repositioned in a variety of ways depending on the method of positioning including using a kicking spud, picking up the spuds and moving with a tug, picking up the spuds and moving with the wires, moving with the wires, moving with the bucket. Mechanical dredges use a variety of methods to measure dredging depth, production and position, ranging from nothing to the latest electronic instrumentation. Probably the most common methods used are depth, lead line surroundings and a tie board, calibrated hoist wires and a tie board, in production, barge displacement, and to position, standard hydrographic survey techniques. More modern mechanical dredging operations employ electronic tide gauges and DGPS. Recently, an electronic hoist wire depth gauge was developed. Mechanical dredge classifications. Mechanical dredges use some form of bucket to excavate and raise material from the channel bottom. The advantages include a minimum amount of water is added to the sediment during the dredging process. The dredging unit is not used to transport dredged materials, which allows uninterrupted dredging since other equipment is used for transport. This is more important the more remote the disposal area is from the dredging site. Disadvantages include a requirement for sufficient dredge cut thickness to fill the bucket to be efficient. Inefficient is in fine-grained sediment, which will wash out of the bucket as it is raised through the water column. Mechanical dredges are classified by how the bucket is connected to the dredge. The three standard classifications are structurally connected, wire rope connected, chain and structurally connected. Transport barges. The following shows some examples of three different types of transport barges, including bottom dump, split hull, and flat top. A bottom dump barge has doors on the bottom of the hopper which open at the dump site to allow the dredged material to fall to the bottom. This results in slower disposal than split hull dump. Material also spreads over a larger area. A split hull barge has two hulls connected with hinges at the front and back. This allows for rapid disposal of dredged sediment and the ability to place material within a small area. A flat top barge transports dredged materials stacked on the barge deck and must be unloaded mechanically at the disposal site. This results in slow disposal time and the ability to drain dredged material with filters prior to disposal. The following is an image of a hydraulic pipeline dredge. The advantages of this type of dredge include continuous operation, cost effective if within pumping distance of the disposal area, more efficient for small dredge cut thickness than bucket dredges. Its disadvantages include a dredging process that adds nine to 10 parts water to one part dredged material. It cannot work in heavy sea conditions. Trash fouls the cutter head and discharge line and anchor wires may impede shipping traffic. The following is an image of a basket cutter with teeth. A basket cutter head is located at the entrance to the suction pipe and is used to agitate soft materials or cut harder materials in order for the suction pipe to hydraulically transport the material. The shape and spacing of the cutter blades varies with the type of material being dredged and teeth or hard facing may be added for hard or abrasive materials. When digging in hard materials, the cutter is only used during the swing in one direction. 
as the cutter teeth will be at the wrong cutting angle in the other direction and tend to pass across the material without cutting it. Applications for the basket cutter head include semi-consolidated and loose sediments that will not flow to suction without mechanical assistance. This image is an example of a dustpan dredge that is plain suction and self-propelled dredge that uses a suction mouth shaped like a large dustpan or vacuum cleaner fitted with water jets for dislodging the bottom sediment. These types have traditional application used in the Mississippi River system and where there is unconsolidated sediment. These images show different types of pipelines associated with the dredging process. Floating pipelines are sensitive to wave motion and block vessel traffic. Submerged pipelines allow vessel traffic to pass but are difficult to monitor for leaks. Land pipelines are easy to monitor for leaks and splits allow multiple discharge locations into disposal area. The following is an example of a hopper dredge. A hopper dredge is a self-propelled seagoing ship equipped with a suction pipe which trails over the side of the vessel or through a well in the hull. The suction pipe hydraulically discharges the material into a hopper or, in the case of a side casting dredge, over the side of the vessel. The hopper dredge transports the material to a disposal site where it can dump the dredged sediment into an open water disposal site or pump the sediment out of the hopper. Dredging methods include, during pumping past overflow, the dredge continues to pump after the hopper level reaches the wear height. A finer grained sediment flows overboard as the heavier sediment settles in the hopper. During agitation dredging, the dredge intentionally discharges large quantities of fine grained sediment by pumping past overflow. This is applicable in high energy areas with sediment that has poor settling characteristics. During pumping to overflow, the dredge stops pumping when the hopper level reaches the wear height and proceeds to the dump. The advantages of this type of dredging include that it works well under adverse sea conditions, performs well in heavy traffic, and is capable of high production. Its disadvantages are that it is unable to dredge cohesive materials and is unsuited for shallow water. Hopper dredge features include drag arm, drag head, gimbal joint, and swell compensator. There are various designs of drag heads for different types of materials. Erosional drag heads are effective for materials ranging from fine sand to gravel. Mechanical drag heads, effective for silts, mud, and light clay. Combinational drag heads, or water jet type, are effective from hard packed sand to gravel. Gimbal joints allow the drag arm to articulate. Swell compensators allow the hopper dredge to work in relatively high wave conditions with a maximum wave condition of 8 to 10 foot swells. Drag arms transport the dredge sediment from the drag head to the hopper. Overflow systems in the hopper are a series of weirs which allow water to flow out of the top of the hopper while the coarse grained sediment settles to the bottom of the hopper. Overflow systems are effective in coarse grained sediment, are less effective in fine grained sediment, and may be losing sediment as fast as it enters the hopper within a short period of reaching overflow, requires an economic load analysis to determine optimum overflow period. Environmental factors to consider include marine animals caught in the drag heads, turbidity from overflow, turbidity at the dump site, air quality, and sound. The following images show examples of U.S. Army Corps of Engineers survey and patrol boats. These images are some of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers inventory of tugboats and towboats. These images show a variety of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers barges. These images show some of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers inventory of crane and derrick barges. These images show some of the specialized U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plant inventory. 
These images show some additional specialized U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plant inventory. Some of the governing authorities for floating plant operations include Department of Defense, Department of Army, and Office of Personnel Management for Human Resources, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for Safety, Licensing, and Inspection, U.S. Coast Guard for Safety, Licensing, and Inspection, American Bureau of Shipping, or ABS, as the Hull and Machinery Classification Authority, and for inspections, Occupational Safety and Health Administration for safety, Environmental Protection Agency for environmental, and local agencies for air and water quality. In summary, in Section 1, Part A, we have been able to identify definitions, background, and types of U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plants, and to identify authorities governing U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plants. The objectives of Section 1, Part B are to identify operations and operating environments of U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plants. Also, to identify safety issues unique to U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plants. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plant operations have both national level and local and regional level interests. Interests at the national level include national union agreements, interagency coordination, funding, safety, while interests of the local and regional level include personnel, scheduling, to include work hours, tours of duty, vessel utilization, regulatory agency coordination, budget submittal and execution, and also safety. The following highlights some of the inspection and licensing requirements for U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plant operations. Specifically, U.S. Coast Guard inspected versus uninspected vessels, where U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plants are public vessels, but U.S. Army Corps of Engineers chooses to subject them to some U.S. Coast Guard inspection. If not inspected by the U.S. Coast Guard, floating plants must be inspected by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers small boats, those under 26 feet, LOA, are subject to U.S. Coast Guard regulations as defined by gross tonnage and subject to U.S. Army Corps of Engineers regulations defined by length. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers motorboat licenses versus U.S. Coast Guard licenses. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers license motorboats up to 26 feet, where the U.S. Coast Guard licenses start at limited master NGT of 100 GT or operator of uninspected passenger vessel, OUPV, of six passengers or less. The required drills and inspections include U.S. Coast Guard inspected floating plant must comply with all U.S. Coast Guard required drills and inspections. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plant not inspected by the U.S. Coast Guard must hold the following drills at least monthly. Abandoned ship, fire drills, man overboard. The first set of drills shall be conducted within 24 hours of the vessel's occupancy or commencement of work. Accident reporting, reportable incidents. The U.S. Coast Guard is interested in marine safety and marine casualties. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is also interested in employee and workplace safety. The reporting thresholds are for the U.S. Coast Guard a marine incident greater than $25,000, a serious marine incident greater than $100,000, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers threshold is at $2,000 or greater, while OSHA requires reporting for incidents greater than $200,000. For U.S. Army Corps of Engineers floating plant safety, operations generally fall under U.S. Coast Guard jurisdiction. However, they can fall under OSHA jurisdiction. It includes dockside and at the anchor, and includes confined spaces as detailed in Section 34.A or OSHA 29 CFR 1910.146. Shipyards fall under the OSHA jurisdiction, 
and confined spaces are addressed in section 34.B or OSHA 29 CFR 1915. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has established the Council for Dredging and Marine Construction Safety with a joint partnership among U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Dredging Contractors of America, and Associated General Contractors. It has evolved from Old Dredge Safety Management Program, DSMP, was established in 2008, encourages sharing of best practices, provides a forum for discussion and resolution of safety-related issues. Additional information can be found at the website located on the screen. The following images are associated with shipboard safety and include both the work environment and PPE, as well as emergency drills and equipment. The following images show a variety of types of personnel transfers. The following shows some of the concerns for environmental safety and waterway traffic. These images show some of the environmental concerns with regards to operating in close quarters. These images show some of the concerns about environmental safety with regards to visibility. This image highlights some of the environmental concerns associated with weather. This image highlights some of the environmental safety concerns associated with sea or high water conditions. Other safety questions include inflatable personal flotation devices. They shall be approved for use but must be reviewed individually by supervisor and employee. Their use must be addressed in an activity hazard analysis. They cannot be used in heavy construction, maintenance, or other work areas in which there is a high likelihood of damage to the vest, including puncturing, burns, or excessive abrasion. The commanding general's list of essential personnel equipment, AKA the chief's list, was approved in 24 September 2009 and includes items not always considered PPE, rain gear, etc.